welcome to our devotion this Friday morning as we continue looking at Psalm 24 and uh, we started looking at what we call general revelation how God has revealed himself through his creation in verse 1 uh, and we spoke about common grace that this is available to all uh, and that's why no one was is with any excuse in terms of seeking God and we looked at the the closing verses when the psalmist uh, who's David says who is this king of glory the Lord strong and mighty the Lord mighty in battle lift up your heads you gates lift them up you ancient doors that the king of glory may come in who is he this king of glory the Lord almighty he is the king of glory and we said yesterday that God's Glory becomes a moral, ethical plumb line by which all of us will be judged. The reality is we all have fallen short of that glory. So the question we posed yesterday is what kind of hope is there for us? The only hope we could have is if in some way God could reveal his glory to us, that he could show us his glory. And we asked the question, how could he do that? Well, he did it through special uh, or saving grace what we call special revelation uh, common grace is how he reveals himself to all creation special grace of revelation is how he reveals himself to those who who seek him and, and and follow him and in the old testament he would do that through what is called the shekinah glory in the shekinah glory the presence and power of god among his people would show up as a pillar of fire a thunder, uh, as a flame, as a cloud above the Ark of the Covenant. There would be a visible manifestation of the presence of God, and the people knew that He was there. For example, in Genesis 1, where we read, And the Spirit of God, the Shekinah glory, was hovering over the face of the waters, in other words, before creation began. And then we have the smoking fire and flaming torch scene, as Abraham walks through the sacrifice and God declares him to be the father of many nations. And then we see the Shekinah glory of God in the burning bush with Moses that we looked at some months ago. And then as a cloud by day and a pillar of fire at night during the Exodus. And then God told them to build a, a tabernacle and they did so. And the Shekinah glory fell uh, as a cloud over the Ark of the Covenant. The people experienced the presence of God and fell down uh, on their faces and they worshipped God. And later in 1 Samuel, they had a conflict with the Philistines who captured the ark and the Shekinah cloud of God's presence departed from them. And later under the reign of Solomon, God instructs him to build a new temple. And once again, the ark is restored and the cloud of glory descends over the ark again. Yet in spite of this, God's people still rebel against him. They worship other gods, even as the presence of God is hovering as a cloud over the ark in the temple. And this continued for hundreds of years until God could tolerate it no longer. And he, he kind of banishes his people into Babylon, into exile in 586 BC. The cloud literally departs. The visible manifestation of the presence of God vanishes. And the people are sent into captivity for 70 years of purification so that the glory of God could once again return. And then in Ezekiel 1, something amazing happens. And let's just read from verse 27 in Ezekiel 1. Prophet in a vision says, I saw that from what appeared to be his waist up, he looked like glowing metal, as if full of fire, and that from there down, he looked like fire and brilliant light surrounded him. Like the appearance of a rainbow in the clouds on a rainy day, so was the radiance around him. This was the appearance of the likeness of the glory of the Lord. When I saw it, I fell down or fell face down and I heard the voice of one speaking. So why is this vision so significant? Well, up to then, God's glory was visible through a cloud through a shining light, through thunder and lightning. So what does Ezekiel actually see? All of that embodied in a human. Listen, he said, from his waist, I saw metal that was flashing like fire. I saw a brilliant illuminated cloud from his waist, from his body. 
we begin to see in Ezekiel the glory of God when it comes again. It will not be as a cloud resting on an ark in a tabernacle. There's no tabernacle. I mean, they're all in exile. Even after Ezra rebuilds the temple, and Nehemiah returns with a remnant, 70 years later to rebuild the walls, the cloud never falls on it again. And so what is Ezekiel saying? He's saying that the glory of God, next time it appears, it will appear as a man. And of course, several, several hundred years passes and a man appears. He himself is not the glory, but he declares that the kingdom of God is at hand and that the glory of one whose sandals he's unworthy to untie is in their midst. And then, of course, Jesus appears. Now let us read John 8 from verse 12, because this is so incredibly revealing uh, in connection with this whole theme of God's glory. It's quite a long passage, but it's really important that we read it. So I'm reading from verse 12. When Jesus spoke again to the people, he said, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Pharisees challenged him. Here you are appearing as your own witness. Your testimony is not valid. Jesus answered, Even if I testify on my own behalf, my testimony is valid. For I know where I came from and where I'm going. But you have no idea where I come from or where I'm going. You judge by human standards. I pass judgment on no one. But if I do judge, my decisions are true. Because I am not alone. I stand with the Father who sent me. In your own law it is written that the testimony of two witnesses is true. I am one who testifies for myself. My other witness is the Father who sent me. Then they asked him, Where is your Father? You do not know me or my Father, Jesus replied. If you knew me, you would know my Father also. He spoke these words while teaching in the temple courts near the place where the offerings were put. And just take note of that. Yet no one seized him because his hour had not yet come so once more jesus said to them i'm going away and you will look for me and you will die in your sin where i go you cannot come this made the jews ask will he kill himself is that why he says where i go you cannot come but he continued you are from below i am from above you are of this world i'm not of this world i told you that you would die in your sins if you do not believe that I am he, you will indeed die in your sins. Who are you? they asked. Just what I have been telling you from the beginning, Jesus replied. I have much to say in judgment of you, but he who sent me is trustworthy, and what I have heard from him I will tell the world. They did not understand that he was telling them about his father. So Jesus said, When you have lifted up the Son of Man, then you will know that I am he and that I do nothing of my own, but speak just what the Father has taught me. The one who sent me is with me. He has not left me alone, but I, for I always do what pleases him. Even as he spoke, many believed in him. So we're going to look at this under various categories. And I just first of all just want to sketch the context for you. So let's look at the context, shall we? So when did this take place? Well, it takes place on the last night of the Feast of Tabernacles. The Feast of Tabernacles was a feast lasting seven days around this time of year and served as a reminder of God's provision for his people during the wilderness journey. They celebrated this provision every year by building little thatched huts to live in as a reminder of what it was like not to have a home. The other thing that they did was to pour out water out of these large jugs as a reminder of how Moses had struck the rock and, of course, out of the rock gushed water to quench the thirst of the Israelites in the desert. The third thing they did during this feast was to every night light a large menorah, which was a whole arrangement of enormous candles, and they did that in the temple. And this was a reminder of the light of God's glory that we had spoken about that appeared as a cloud in the Old Testament. They lit the menorah every night except the last night of the feast. 
and they celebrated that last night in total darkness. And that darkness was a reminder of the fact that the cloud of God's Shekinah glory had not been seen in the temple or anywhere for centuries. And that is the context that we need to understand this whole passage in. And tomorrow we'll go into other aspects of God's glory as it starts to become revealed in the New Testament. Amazing stuff. And I pray that as we go through this, we'll really come to a better understanding understanding of what God's glory uh, really means. So let's bow in a moment of prayer. Lord, we just thank you again for your word. We just thank you for the incredible theme that runs throughout Scripture of how your, your glory appeared in, in kind of a physical way in the Old Testament, uh, above the Ark of the Covenant and through thunder and lightning and so on, and how uh, Ezekiel's prophecy just makes, makes it clear that that glory would, would ultimately appear in, in the form of a person. And of course, we know that that person was was our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And so we pray that as we we continue to read these scriptures, especially the the, the relevance of this passage in John 8, that we would come to a, a greater understanding of the Shekinah glory of God and, and how that, that glory is, is with us today. And so we just pray your blessing on us as we continue into this day, uh, as we continue into this weekend, and we pray that as we start to uh, just tie this all up in, in Psalm 24, that the relevance of of this will become more apparent to us in, in the subsequent days. And so just bless us as we continue uh, to seek you and just to, to serve you. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We'll bless you all. Have a great weekend and we'll catch up with you on Monday. Bye for now.